Now we're, we're like, you know, the old grandpa's like, get off my lawn, kids, you know? <laughs> and, and maybe that's just us, this is us just being like, you know, cranking in the corner where like, you don't know what good music is, you know? Because like, when we were coming up, we, like, we had people say that to us too. Yeah. And we're like, who are these people? And then sometimes I think, is it the, is it the times or is it now we're just, the, guard, the, the change of the guards, and we're now, we're, now, we're now the old guard and the new guards coming. You know? All right, welcome back for another episode of Left Foot, Right Foot. You know, Derek, it's been about three years since the COVID shutdowns. Do you think we're back to normal yet? Three years. Three years have gone by really fast. I think that for me, I personally think I'm back to where I was pre-pandemic. In terms of as a whole community, I think we're slowly getting there. I think we're probably around like 80% there. Now, I think that there are a lot of effects, large term consequences that happen due to COVID. And that's kind of what we're gonna spend this video talking about. Like what really happened to Tango uh, post COVID and what were some of the things that we're really feeling the, the hit right now. And for me, Rob, I think for me, I feel like people have become less risk adverse and more, I guess, more picky in a sense. I think more, I think people are more picky, especially in our LA scene, than pre-pandemic. Mm, I definitely agree that we are definitely more picky, but I, I don't think we're back to normal, or I don't think, you know, when I think of back to normal or everything's back to the way it was. I see there's a lot more, uh, I see a lot more damage that damage. I, I see it as damage because I, I see it as there's a wound that happened, that COVID happened from, you know, the shutdown and business has changed drastically. Sure. If you want to look at the economics, it changed the, the cost. We all know the cost of everything went up, including Milongas yeah. and but events. I, but I also mean the damage of like the community, like how the community reacts to each other and how um, we we're, I don't think we're as giving as you said like we're more risk, we're more risk adverse but I think one of the biggest one of the biggest impacts that I see is that you know there's two years about two years of no new dancers so we have new dancers who just started right after COVID like you know right after COVID a tier gap and then someone who's been in it for three years maybe they were secretly dancing or maybe they're practicing on their own but it's pretty much we don't have a lot of one to two year dancers because of that, because of that gaps. So there's zero and then there's three. Uh, so there's no happy made. There's no middle ground. Yeah, and I think that that's one of the causes of people being more risk adverse because I think you know when you're a one year dancer, you're more likely to hang around and be with a, a new a the new other person. one year yeah dancers, or or, or right. a zero year you know yeah the cohort yeah. Um, if you're a three-year dancer, chances are, chances are you're not going to want to spend a lot of time with a zero to one. You know, you want to stick to th like two to four, you know. So that's why I see, because of that gap, I feel that the people who are just starting off have almost little to no support. And that's kind of stunting the growth of tango. That's a good point, especially for young people that are trying to lead, because I feel like because everybody is more risk adverse and more picky in terms of who they dance with. Beginning leads, I feel, get shut out. That's like the, the primary target of people that get shut out is the, uh, the beginning leads. Yeah, and do you think, well, do you think the beginning followers get shut out or maybe people who are, let's say, not as popular because uh, they didn't keep up or their, their level isn't as high? Like, I think, before, there was, a, there was a wider range of average, you know, the average dancer was fairly good and there was a lot of them. Right. And I feel that now it's, you have a lot of good dancers, not so many average dancers and a lot of, you know, people who probably ca couldn't use some more room for improvement or they haven't been keeping up because, you know, they sat out for two years or life happened or whatever. Uh, economics happen and you know there's a little there's a, definitely a strain on the pocketbook that's a fair fair assessment I talked to some more experienced dancers and a lot of people told me especially here in LA one of the reasons why a, 
there people are more picky is because there are more couples, mm. right? So now people used to come and there used to be a lot more single people. Mm -hmm. And now since the time people got together and now people come with their, their partners to the Milongas and that's less dances for non-partner people. Do you think that's a byproduct of COVID? Because you know there are a lot of people who just shacked up for COVID. That's a good point. That's a good, yeah. I wouldn't know because I didn't shag up during COVID. <laughs> we were a long distance couple and we didn't see each other and that was pretty much the primary reason why uh, one, one of my past relationships terminated. And so that, that could be, that could be a, a thing. Yeah, because um, it doesn't have to necessarily be like a couple, like a relationship relationship, but I do know a lot of people, uh, especially with COVID, they were, they were really looking at how to be very safe. So they talked about, oh, this is my pod. I can only, I'm only dancing with my six people that I invite to my home because I trust that you know, they're vaccinated, they're very safe, whatever. But those are the six people I'm, I'm inviting to my home. So it, they end up like having strengthened that bond of like just the six people or the four oh. people or three people. It is, I'm not necessarily saying boyfriend, girlfriend, yeah. but I am saying like- Close friends. Yeah. Or whatever that is. Like, and so well, maybe then they come to the pack as a milong and they only dance with those people? Yeah, because like they, they've been doing it for so they've been doing it for the two years we're out, or they've just strengthened that bond so much that like they feel like these are my friends, these are my compadres, and I don't know these people, other people yet. Or, you know, they're we haven't ha we haven't really gone out en masse and have started having lunch and dinner with each other. Hmm. That's fair. And in LA I don't I, I think that we could do more of that, more of out, external events outside of the Milonga. Mm -hmm. I think that's super important. We, we've started at the taco thing on Tuesdays after Guapa, and we started posting more, and now people are like, hey, when are you guys, I didn't know you guys got tacos after the Milonga. And like, yeah, we just, we just, it used to be just me and Rob, and we would kind of talk about uh, the podcast, talk about other things, and kind of keep up. But now more people want to kind of join us, so that's kind of a cool thing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and you know, I'd love to like, just hang out with more people. The other thing I was thinking about is when we got back post-COVID, everyone, everyone was like, hey, I love the afternoon events. Yeah, we didn't, we, it took a while for us to cycle to the, the nightlife again. I don't think we, that's one thing that we haven't come back. I think a lot of people do not like the late Malongas. Yeah, it's, and if they did, it's only, it's only a few people. So the whole idea of the all-nighters, the... You know, coming in at one in the morning to get your best tonic from one to three. Yeah, that, that's going to five a.m., six a.m. Those that, days are long gone here in L.A. Yeah, I mean, is it long gone or is it just on life support? Like it's dormant. Yeah, I think it's long gone. I think people really appreciate going to bed at a certain time now. And like you said, afternoon malangas are more popular. I would love to see. You know what was funny? I was just in uh, D.C. for Marathon Z, and one of the interesting things I saw was that because Marathon Z is like a long event, six days, five, six days, people took some of their laptops and their workstations and brought it to the afternoon malangas. Mm -hmm. And so you could see people setting up their little workstations, dance a tanda and come back and do some work on their laptop. And I was like, I wonder if that's the future of malangas. Like you just, everyone works remote and you, you would go to our malanga during the day and we just dance with each other, go back to your workstation and do some work and then dance. You know. Actually, I would say that's closer. To, that's closer to what a lot of people say that tango should be with the Kodigos, as in the whole. You you shouldn't be dancing every single tanda. You shouldn't be marathoning it out. Uh, you should dance with what you want. You know, and people would generally talk with each other, chat with each other. There's a big social thing. Yeah. And maybe part of that is, hey, I'm I'm here working, and then I'm gonna look up when I want to look up and want. When I hear the song I want to dance to, then I'm going to look up and see what's there. Right. Uh, maybe that, that's closer to what a lot of people, a lot of the older generation were talking I'm talking about people who were dancing in the 70s, uh, how they described tango. That's, that's what it is. And maybe we're getting closer to, the, to that because of it. I mean, I wouldn't mind it. I think that's kind of cool. I mean, although my job isn't really remote, teaching is, was very difficult teaching online and remote. And I would not want to go back to that. But I think that for the most people that can have a remote job, it's definitely beneficial. And we've seen a lot more afternoon events spring up because of these kind of uh, popularity of time changes. And I don't know. To me, it's just, it's interesting. 
I feel like I have definitely more energy. And when you see the sun, it's something, there's something different about dancing and knowing that the sun is out. And especially the sun, just, it feels like it just stays out forever now. Definitely. I mean, I have, I have a funny theory about that, too, because I, I don't remember it ever. I don't ever remember the sunset being at 8 o'clock. <laughs> so I have this weird theory that I seriously feel that the, 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 til, the, the tilt of the axis is changing. <laughs> It's not global warming. It's uh, I think it's the, the tilt of the axis is changing. Jeez. But besides that, one thing I've actually I, I, I'm I'm kind of trying to grapple with is now that everyone's appreciating the after Malanga, do you think that's changed music wise? Because you know we've talked about oh um, you know this feels like an afternoon Malanga set and not an evening set. So do you think maybe now like people's appreciation for, appreciation for certain type of music, certain DJs, it's gonna change because of everyone gravitating towards um, afternoon malangas. So you probably won't get that whole deep Pugliese as much as you do in the evening. And we're probably more like Tenturi, Darienzo, maybe the, the age of Kolo is falling in, in Los Angeles and we're going back to the age of Darienzo again. That's interesting because I, I thought it was just me, but I personally thought that we've evolved out, out of the Darienzo phase of LA. And I think more and more people actually appreciate more of the Kahlo, like Damare, Troy Lo Marino. Well, I, I think that there is a lot of room for that, whereas before it was more like, just play your Darienzo, your Tanturi, your Fast Troy Lo, all this stuff, we'd rather have that. But now, I don't know. I mean, because I've seen it and I've seen people just dance to it. I personally didn't like, I, I like variety over anything. And so I need some contrast. And so, yes, there are some DJs that have been recently played in, in L.A. that are just like, We're, are you playing Donato at 2 a.m.? Like, it's 2 a.m. Why are you playing Donato? Like, I don't understand. Yeah. But there are people out there dancing, and so who am I to say? But for me, it's just like, wow. So here's the other question. Now, is that necessarily a town thing, a time thing, or an experience thing? What do you mean? Well, when you and I first started, we were definitely – you know, full steam Darienzo dance every tanda. Yeah. Right? Definitely. And, you know, we don't, we don't, there aren't that many, I, I, I don't want to call us old timers, but there aren't that many people who've been dancing for 10 years or 10, 10 plus years. Well, yeah. you'd be surprised. Our, our community well, has a lot of those. No, we, we, we do. But, I mean, but the mass of the Malanga is really three to five. That's, that's what I'm trying to point at. And when we were dancing for three to five, we were, like hardcore Darian, so I didn't, I didn't even care for Desarly. So yeah, and then no. as a DJ, I remember there was one, there was a couple nights where I didn't even play Desarly. Now looking back, I'm like, wow. Yeah, and how now, could I ever do that? Yeah, now I'm like, oh man, I missed that Desarly. I missed that, you know. <laughs> uh, and, and I remember I used to go, oh man, like it's kind of funny because I always, I always joke that I love the things that I suck at. <laughs> so, because I, I was like, I was, I'm really good to Starly, but I don't like to Starly. Yeah, give me and, the rhythm. Yeah, give me the rhythm. And I, I, I generally suck at rhythm. I was really, I was a lot better at melody. Yeah. And really. now, I'm, now I'm thinking like, oh man, now I get to milk this stuff. Like, <laughs> yes, the, like give me the Starly, give me the Kalo, give me all this stuff, you know. But um, so that's why I think maybe it's an experience thing, and the the bulk of the bulk of people coming back into tango because I think we lost a lot of super experienced people, uh, whether it be life, like life change, like af life after COVID change for them. Yeah. They, they thought, oh, they found I'm, other hobbies, other yeah. passions. They didn't need to dance as much as they thought they needed it. Yeah. Or they moved away they or moved, whatever. Yes. Or so, they got married, got kids. Yeah. So that's what I mean. It's like, is it, a, maybe it's an experience thing. And now we're, we're like, you know, the old grandpa's like, get off my lawn, kids, you know? <laughs> and, and maybe that's just us, this is us just being like, you know, cranky in the corner where like, you don't know what good music is, you know? Because like, when we were coming up, we, like, we had people say that to us too. Yeah. And we're like, who are these people? And then sometimes I think, is it the, is it the times or is it now we're just, the guard, the, the change of the guards, and we're now we're not we're now the old guard and the new guards coming, you know? I so. think both can be true. I think for me, I just, I didn't fall so much into the Desarly because I felt like every teacher in LA when we were starting in those first 
five years, we're always playing the Sarley in the class. It's and so good. I hate it. It's like always the same the Sarley, always the same like instrumental the Sarleys. And I was just like, no, please. Yeah, it's always Bahia Blanca and Don Juan. Oh, God, yes. Dun, dun. Oh, man. Yes. I but... hate Don Juan. I still hate Don Juan. <laughs> really? As much as, as, much as I, I like it, actually, now. Oh, dear. I've evolved. No. Yeah. <laughs> I've evolved. Well... I've become the Don Juan. <laughs> 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 no, no, I, I, Don, I still can't do Don Juan. I mean, mm. I remember there was a class I took, and they played Don Juan, but not just any Don Juan. They played all the variations of Don Juan. So oh, it's yeah, like, like it's the 30s, different. the 50s, yeah. the late 60s. And or... it's like, okay, I, I, I guess that's variety, but not really. Not what I'm looking for, you know. Mm. But yeah, no, I, I can't do Don Juan. I can't do Don Juan. So I, yeah, definitely it depends on how you were your experiences when you were growing up in tango, I guess. Yeah. But so. going back to, are we back to normal in COVID? I mean, I think it, it's kind of, it's kind of funny because the other thing I, I see is that we're not getting the critical mass like we, like we did in the past. And I know, you know, we talk about like, I, I'm more look, I always look at things from the economic side, but one of the things that I always point out is when you have critical mass, like it's, when you have like 80 people, it's easy to hit 100. But when you have 20, it's hard to get 21. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's, that's what I mean is that sometimes I feel like because of the price scale, because uh, it's more competitive because everyone, everyone's just trying to get their foot in the door again, right. uh, because rent's gotten really crazy, mm -hmm. uh, you know, everyone's just like, you know, juking for position and no one's respecting each other anymore. And they're like, who cares? Like, you know, business is business, it's war, whatever, you know, it's, I, I feel that we're never getting critical mass and everyone's just pointing at everyone else where they'll, they'll just say, oh, well, you know, we're splitting the community and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, they should just close one day and it's better for everybody. I think we hit critical mass. I mean, I don't think we never hit. I think it's quite more frequent than you think. Maybe. I think we hit a uh, good 150, depending on the night, depending on the location, really? depending right. on the performers, depending on the DJ. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, last Friday, I'd say, okay, yeah, maybe that's a 150. But honestly, like, what I've been seeing is more like 40 to 80. Hmm. You know, and, and mostly, and close to, than, on average, I would say closer to 50. 50, maybe it's just where I go. But I, I see more, like, 50 to 60 than a hundred. Where back then it was almost like everyone was hitting, like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, it, it, it was a hundred plus, you know? And I, it's almost like, yeah, I get those days are long gone and we're, just, we're rebuilding, but at the same time, I just feel that uh, we're at a point where it's really hard to hit the critical mass. And, I, and for me, I don't see the critical mass yet. Uh, every once in a while I do see it, but it's it's far and few. That's that's my perspective. It's a never-ending cycle of trying to get more people in this dance. We all have tried. We've all tried our advertising things and promotions. Uh, I would like to think about another thing, which is the idea of etiquette and the idea mm. of compassion towards the fellow people in the community. Do mm. you think that's changed? I, that's definitely changed. I mean, I, I've, I've often heard people say, oh, like almost every single Malanga, you have to show up with a partner or else you'll never get a dance. And, and, and that's very scary. Like, as a per, if as a person who probably were just, were just average before, you know, I, I think that's very scary because you know they don't have they, they don't have the reputation of the weight to really attract a lot of people. And back then, when you're average, you, there's a lot of other average dancers. Now I feel like there's there's like a big gap. There's good dancers. There's new dancers. And there's a few average dancers. And generally, you know, I, I think it's hard for them to get good dancers because then I think the good dancers kind of really locked in their, their pods or like their couples or whatever because, you know, they, I, I think they, they play the game just like they play the marathons where, where like you don't go to a marathon unless you start calling people and kind of go, oh, you're going there? Okay, I'm going to go there too. That's fair. And I, and I think that, that, that now it's, that uh, they're, they're kind of doing the same thing at the Malangas. I feel like the average person- Is just shut out. Yeah, they just shut out. And then they just don't want to go out anymore. And then they'll just go to the Pratikas here and there. 
You know what I tell, what I hear from those average type dancers that confide to me is that, and I know this is gonna <laughs> maybe uh, trigger some people out there, but a lot of them have told me that women are just more picky now. Like women don't, don't give them the time of day. A lot of women don't even look and acknowledge their existence. And I don't know, just well, I, I don't I don't have that experience as much. I'm privileged and lucky. Uh, for whatever, for whatever reason, but that's what a lot of people have told me, that women are just way too picky now, mm. and guarded now. That's funny, because I, I hear from the other side. What do you mean? I hear from, like, the average, la the average ladies, yeah. and they're just like, oh, you know, the guys, like, they, they just don't want to dance. You know, like, they're only, they're only going, for, there's, there's so many ladies that, that they're only going for what they're really aiming for, and, mm. you know, they're using the, the gender imbalance to their advantage. So it's not like people are kind anymore. They're gonna start dancing multi tanas with only their, their four friends, and their uh, and then the average dancers are, are just gonna pick up like the solo ladies who are really good, who haven't you know who didn't come with their pods. So it, it's really tough for an average dancer because you know not just not just the average dancer, but even the new dancers. Because I keep on hearing new dancers keep on telling me, oh hey, you know I I, I don't go to the Friday Saturday malongs. It's, it's just very intimidating. I'll never get a dance or anything both from the guys and the girls. So it's, I don't know, man, I mean. I can see that. I mean, I, I definitely see that in the Malangas, absolutely in LA. We do have a pretty significant imbalance. Um, I make fun and say we're Los Angeles, and sometimes it does happen where we have a, uh, a lot of leads, but that's very rare, I will admit. And it is an unfortunate scenario, because yes, I also kind of fall into that line of dancing with uh, a lot of closer friends that are more advanced and in my own pod and multiple tandas. And so, but I do try to dance with other people as well. Um, it's, it's tough. It's a, it's a tough, yeah. it's tough. Yeah. And then the other thing I keep hearing is um, not just, it, it's also like, the men will actually reject more. Like uh, what I see a lot is a lot of ladies going out of their way to ask men to dance. Really? Yeah. Like they'll chat people up and be like, oh, hey, you want to dance? I, I see that more often now than not. Where before oh. it was generally they would do they would utilize the Marat, Miranda or Marada? Yeah, Marada. Marada. They they utilize that more. Yeah. And now it's just like they're going through the cup the chataseo, they're doing all that stuff. Uh, and then even with that, Ben will shoot them down. Like, like uh, I, a friend of mine last Friday which just said, oh, you know, I, I was introduced to this guy, and then I said, hey, you want to dance? And he said, there's a reason why I don't dance with you. Oh, just straight wow, up. Oh, jeez. You know? Uh, and, and that's, like, shocking for, especially, you know, <laughs> mm. it's like, whoa, okay? And especially when the, there was an introduction. So, you know, it's, it's, it's tough. I... I can, that's, that's totally fair. I definitely, yeah, I could see that. I can see that guys maybe are too picky now too. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Um, Cause girl, girl, when we were in tango, we, I, at least from my perspective, I was very for, like very thankful and appreciative of anyone who danced with me, mm. right? Especially in the beginning. I didn't, I didn't go out and search for like the top tier dancers at the Milonga. Um, in the beginning, I, you kind of, I thought it was like almost like a rite of passage that you go and try to dance with everybody yeah. and of all shapes, sizes, experience. Mm -hmm. But uh, maybe that's changed dramatically. No, I think it definitely has changed because I, generally I, I don't see people dancing with everybody anymore. And I think in the past, you know, you used to see a lot of beginning guys would dance with more experienced ladies. Uh, and. And it's what, really rare now. And yeah, now it's like everyone's just aiming for the top of the top. Either the top of the top or the most attractive. That's true. So, uh, so I, so the, so a lot of the um, ladies who put in their time, mm. they kind, they do definitely do get overlooked, and I think they get overlooked more often now than before. I definitely do see that where even the less experienced guys are always trying to dance with the more attractive, the like younger newer mm -hmm. dancers and then those same people are also fighting against the more experienced dancers that are also trying to dance with the more younger attractive mm -hmm. inexperienced dancers mm -hmm. and so you have a clash there and so hmm, that's interesting that is interesting
Well, is there anything can be done about it, or I mean, or are we just kind of waiting for the dust to settle? Well, I mean, you can't really, you can't really, add, you can't really force people to dance with everybody. I can't. You can't. It's not the organizer's job either. I know some people are going to say, well, the organizers, the organizers can encourage and be more of like a role model, but they can't force people to dance with somebody no. else. Um, I talked actually at the marathon with Mitra, and she made a very interesting, insightful um, uh, talk to one of my friends. Um, she, she, she was saying that tango is like, it's so, it's a very um, daunting thing when you look at this whole thing that we do. We go, uh, we go to a malanga and we put all of our emotions here and, and like put ourselves on the line and put ourselves out there to be rejected or to be uh, put our put our emotions into somebody else and and at any time and it's it's like you should have the preference to dance with, with who you want to dance with right is this this is this really high stakes scenario that we all partake in and so you should like there should be a kind of value that you dance with certain people and that should be respected right you should want to dance who with who you want to dance with yeah right because you are putting your trust in that person you are putting your emotions in with that person you are connecting for 12 minutes from the time to or more yeah but how do you but i get that but then how do you avoid the black book how do you avoid the black book? because that's the whole point it's like if you're only if you're not giving people chances because it's such high risk high stakes I mean, we just talked about the black book, and I'm like, like oh, this, guy, this person never gave me a shot. Yeah. So, I mean, aren't we just perpetuating this? Yeah, I mean, that's true, too. It's, that's tough. I, there's no easy answer. I think if there was an easy answer, we'd probably be practicing it or trying it. Yeah. So, yeah. there's no easy, <laughs> easy solution. I can't even. I mean, I, for me, I, I don't think there is a solution. I think it's just um, nature takes its course, mm. you know, and... Sometimes nature is just a very cruel, you know, system. Yeah. Because people are going to have their preferences no matter what you do. Yeah. And, you know, even if you are a great underrated dancer, because I know a lot of that happens. Like, I was talking to some of my, of my other friends at Milonga, and they were like, he was, the, he, he was like, yeah, I'm like one of the most underrated dancers in, in L.A. And I was like, okay, interesting. And... Um, like, what do you do about that? Like, what do you even, what if you are under the radar? You are some, like, you don't get enough credit as you should. Well, you know, I, that's, that's something that I have, like, a love-hate with that statement. Why? Well, because one part, are you under, are you, why are you underrated? Like, that, that, that has to because be, Because people like, don't give you a, the, the chance to prove yourself. Yeah, but then sometimes, or is it that you think no one gave you the chance, but then you're really just not that good. Mm. You know, that, that's, you know I, I've come under those thoughts many times, and that's why I, I, now like, I, I've been training a lot harder. I've been really taking more classes. I've been really, I, I've been really putting myself out there. Um, I think the stage thing has been great for me, uh, both as uh, a dancer, as a person who likes movement, and also as a social dancer. But you know, I understand stage is not for everybody. Definitely not. But at the same time, it's those thoughts that propelled me to push myself and and to try to be better dancers. Because maybe I ha like in the back of my head, I've got something to prove. Sure. You know. And sometimes I think it's sometimes it's easy for someone to just go, oh, I'm I'm just underrated or no one appreciates like what I have. And sometimes, you know, there's that could be true or it could be no one appreciates what you have because there's nothing to appreciate. That is fair. I mean, I guess if your dance was really good, it would kind of spread like wildfire. Right? Yeah. You would dance with one person and they go, oh, have you danced with Rob? Like, yeah. that was amazing. And then that's kind of like, that's how things set up. Yeah, but then also at the same time. So, so one, one of the things that I also see is that when you're also giving, people just go, oh, uh, you know, he doesn't really dance with a lot of good dancers, so it can't be that good. So I, I see that point too. Mm. Um, so that's why I have this love hate with this idea, like, oh, I'm just underrated, because <laughs> because what is it really? Like, I don't know, you know. And, and sometimes it's just a cough out, you know, where it's like, oh, well, you know, they just don't know what's here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it's, I, I think anyone who feels underrated, um, I think if anything, they should really talk to their friends 
and, I, and I'm talking about real friends. And, and what I mean by real friends, like friends who are, are willing to tell you the truth, uh, the painful truth, whether you want, whether you want it or not. Because, <laughs> no, because like I like I have friends who are like they'll never tell me if I look like crap, mm. right? But then I have friends who were like, oh, Rob, like that was a bad move, you know? Or, yeah, no, like you should watch, you should watch yourself in the video and then, and, and then, and then come back and talk to me. You know, <laughs> well, you know and, and those are, you know, as much as, uh, as painful as that is, uh, those friends will actually help propel you to be better. And I think it's very easy for people to just um, say these things because they want sympathy and they want like someone to go, Oh, you know, you're amazing. Don't think like that. You know, uh, and sometimes I think the soft approach just allows people to, you know, it's what's it called like to never rise because they're because of low expectations. Oh, you know, yeah, you set the bar so low. Yeah, and it's like, oh, hey, you know, just, everyone give me compliments. I need my participation award. And sometimes I feel like. That's one of the things that I actually I see more of now that's really hurting us uh, post-COVID. Is Everyone that, wants their participation trophy? In a sense, yes. I mean, like, when we talk about competition, there's a lot more, there's a lot more medals now for just, I don't, you know, there's, I, yeah, there's a lot more categories, but there's definitely a lot more medals. There's a lot more of everything. You know, before there was no Am-Am, there's no Pro-Am. There's, it, it's, it just seems like there's a lot of participation awards going out there. Um, and then in addition to that, it, it's almost like no one is willing to like say anything critical because I've seen a lot of videos get posted up and a lot of it is like, I'll tell people- Slay queen. Yeah, or like, oh my <laughs> God, it's so amazing. Or like, oh, look at those beautiful legs. And I'm like, ah, you know? Yeah. And, and I look at this, I'm like, oh, what are, are we watching the same thing? Yeah. And if they're my friend, I'll, 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 I'll talk to them personally. I'm like, yeah, you know, wasn't a fan of that or, or something. I won't be like a total jerk about it. But sometimes I think that one of the, one of the bad byproducts of COVID is that um, we're... People are afraid to be honest? Well, not that, well, people are afraid to be critical because everyone's so like on guard and uh, easily offended. And maybe that's from COVID. Maybe, maybe that's like uh, a byproduct of COVID. Maybe it's a byproduct of what happened around COVID, like the times of COVID. Right. Maybe that's, uh, I don't know, or maybe we're just like more politically pol polarized and everyone's more on guard. Yeah. I, I have no idea what it is. But that's something that I seem to notice more is that people are less likely uh, to be critical. Yeah, because you, there is so much uh, hailstorm that can uh, come back at you if you do critique or come off the wrong way and get canceled or whatever, right? Yeah. And have this army of, you know, keyboard typist people, like, you know, slay, yeah. thriving away at you. So I don't know, like, um, so it's, I, I don't know how much we got through in this video either in terms of post pandemic, but let us know because we're, we're strictly speaking from our experiences and our experiences in LA. Of course, I travel a little bit more than Rob, so I can speak for a little bit more things outside of that. But I will say that I feel like myself, I'm back to my pre-COVID state, but things have definitely drastically changed post-COVID now. And, I, and we, we really haven't gone back as a community in a lot of ways, or it's changed and evolved in a lot of different ways. But we would like to know, let us know in the comments on how you think the post-COVID era of Tango is in your own city, in your own community. We would like to know. And um, yeah, but thank y'all for watching and we will catch you on the next one. Thank you for watching the latest episode of Left Foot, Right Foot. Please click the subscribe button and the notification bell to keep up to date with our latest videos. We greatly appreciate it. Also, if you can, click the like button. It really helps us with the algorithm. We're, our goal is really to make tango, social tango in the community more uh, available to the mass public. And that's pretty much our goal with the whole channel. So if you could click that like button, it really goes a long way. Thank y'all so much. Ever want to meet us live or say hi? We will be at the San Diego Tango Marathon August 16th through 18th, 2024. So if you want to say hi to us or catch us on our live podcast, make sure you are there.